big warm welcome to all SPH parents, faculty, staff, students, and all the ladies and gentlemen we have in the call. It's an honor to have you with us and we have a really interesting topic ahead of us. What you just saw were uh, a lot of pictures from across the SPH facilities. And I know uh, myself as an SPH alumni, I really miss the, um, that site. I really miss the feel, I miss everything about that school. Um, and we are in such an unprecedented time where even the students currently enrolled in the school will also miss those facilities as well. My name is Rachel and I am an alumni of Sekolah Pelita Harapan uh, Lipo Karawachi, what we now know as Lipo Village. Uh, and it's my honor today to moderate this discussion about the new pandemic generation, right? How do we shape our future in the midst of COVID-19? Joining me today is an excellent panel of speakers uh, and it is my honor to introduce them. We will have today Ibu Eileen Hambali, Associate Head of School for Sekolah Prita Harapan, Alex Tho, SPH Infection Control Team Leader, and also Administrative Principal of SPH Pruitt Village. We will also have with us Ibu Caroline Riadi, Chief Executive Officer of Siloam Hospitals Group. We have Julie McCohen, Chief of Quality and Clinical Operations of Siloam Hospitals Group. We will also have the honor of the presence of Dr. Alan Widianto, Chief Pulmonologist, a leading medical expert for Siloam Hospital Group COVID-19 response team, and also Vice Dean of the Upeha Faculty of Medicine. Last but not least, we will have Dr. Yogi Prawira, a highly respected pediatrician, chief of the COVID-19 task force for the Indonesian Pediatric Society and pediatric consultant in emergency and intensive care for Siloam Hospital Group in Tebesi Matubang. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, before we begin, just a couple of um, simple housekeeping rules. I'd like to remind you to stay on mute and to also keep your video off for the duration of the session. You're very welcome to submit your questions uh, via the chat box. So you'll notice at the bottom of your screen, you have the option of entering into the chat. You're welcome to go into there. There will be instructions there as to how and who you can submit your questions to. Okay. So, um, before we begin, I hope you're feeling very well. Uh, the first guest I'd like to welcome uh, to center stage this morning is Ibu Eileen. Ibu Eileen, how are you? Good morning. Hi, Rachel. Can you hear me? Hi. Yeah, I can hear you very well. Thank you for joining us. Uh, Ibu Eileen, uh, Ibu Eileen your brainchild. Uh, you've been the driving force behind setting up this discussion today, as well as the collaboration you have right now at SPH with Siloam Hospitals Group. So the first question is, how did that all come about? Uh, well, I believe it is fresh in our mind uh, what happened the last uh, few months, uh, especially when uh, coronavirus, uh, COVID-19 came to Indonesia and precisely uh, in Jakarta. I think we all uh, experience very uh, different degrees of fear, um, personal at personal level or family level and in the school as well. So um, we have to change our learning system from face-to-face -to, -face to home based learning um, even though our teachers uh, were accustomed to using the home based learning platform because they have, they have used that in the classroom but the transition uh, honestly were not easy um, because uh, because of many different things uh, the initial plan was just for two weeks home based learning and then it's extended to a few more weeks until the end of the school year and we were also worried about the final exam of the grade 12 and parents are also not used to the system uh, being, uh, you know, having to sit next to the students, the, the, ch the children actually, you know, to make sure that they learn uh, through the home-based learning and teacher were also challenged because they have children, their own children to look after. And at the same time, um, you know, they have to, to do the home-based learning for the students. So anyway, it was kind of jumbled up all together and uh, we were so unsure about this uh, coronavirus movement uh, in Indonesia and in the world. Um, over the time, as much as we try to, uh, as much as possible to make home-based learning uh, the best, uh, you know, the best method of learning, but we know that face-to-face -face is what we actually all want, especially from kindergarten to grade 12, we believe that relationship between uh, peers and also between teachers is very important. So anyway, uh, we look forward to that uh, so so much, and we cannot uh, wait to you know to return. But we do not know uh, when is the time. So that was a little bit of the background of what happened uh, since uh, probably March to uh, to May. 
And as soon as the summer holiday begin uh, early June, uh, you know, among the leaders of SPH, uh, we immediately form uh, a team, several teams actually, to plan on how we open the new school year. Uh, we were hoping that we could open in August. Uh, we did this because uh, we have to have many plans as we do not know uh, what will happen in August. And it was a very good teamwork, I believe. And, um, you know, throughout this time, we learned so much because uh, we have to contact several of our friends in different, uh, different schools uh, overseas as well to find out how they do it, what are their, uh, their plans and everything. So, um, so yeah, but uh, so we made a contact, we made contacts with uh, schools, people uh, from uh, America, from uh, Singapore, uh, from Indonesia as well, and also from uh, Malaysia. And they were gracious enough to share their plans. And uh, I, I believe that we all uh, discovered that we're in the same storm, yet we are in different boats uh, because we all have uh, different challenges uh, in the context of where we live. Uh, for example, in Indonesia, we are tropical countries uh, versus, you know, in Shanghai, uh, it's four seasons. Um, and two out of five of our campus are also uh, in a building, which is different than a sprawling ground campus. And uh, we also have dormitory in one of the uh, of our campus that most uh, uh, most schools that we contacted do not have that. And also, uh, you know, in the context of us, we have helpers, we have drivers that later on we have to put into this, uh, you know, consideration on how, uh, especially uh, on how we provide this uh, safe environment, especially in the challenge of COVID-19 virus. So um, uh, as we continue to search, um, I guess we come back, uh, you know, as much as we get all the information from them and they were gracious enough to give it to us and uh, all the news that we get, but I guess it's not, uh, we don't have enough uh, foundation to build upon for our new norm, for our new academic year, uh, that we feel it's safe enough. Uh, because, you know, because we're, we're just different. Each of us is just different. So although the, the discussion was quite encouraging, especially when we met uh, the, the, the teacher from the Shanghai International School, the Concordia International School, they were just, uh, a, they just opened the school at that time, to, uh, two weeks, uh, because they closed the school in January. And in the month of May, they opened the school. Uh, so we were really encouraged to see that there are school that managed to you know, open, which means that the virus were under control in such that uh, to the level that uh, they, feel, uh, they feel comfortable in opening the school. So that was very encouraging. But again, uh, we cannot just copy paste their SOP. We cannot just copy paste what they teach us. Um, so I believe God's help is never late. And in the midst of this difficulty, uh, I met with Siloam team, uh, uh, you know, just uh, through casual conversation. And I came to understand that uh, Siloam as a hospital deals with uh, all kinds of viruses every day from the entrance of the hospital to the patient's room, to the operating room, and uh, to, in every part of the hospital. So as a result, infectious prevention control is um, imminent and must be, must be uh, implemented in a routine hospital. So they, uh, they offer us help to evaluate our school and to come and to uh, teach us about what actually infectious prevention control that we often call IPC and how to deal with it because in the context of school obviously it's different than hospital it's different than malls it's different than restaurant so uh so yeah that was exciting that was really uh kind of like um enlightening for enlightening for us all of us so i went back to the team and we decided to you know to to start the uh the process with the siloam team and we've done that since about uh, i believe six weeks or seven weeks ago so that's a long answer to the short question. No, I love that. I think um, you said a few things there that I want to um, just emphasize on. I think the topic of schools reopening is something that gives a lot of parents a little bit of anxiety or a lot of anxiety. There's a lot of parents in this group who really do want to know what it entails. And I think you honed in there on some of the things that make infectious disease control so difficult in Indonesia. 
we're tropical, we have a community around us, it's not just the family. And there's all kinds of details that make it more difficult. And um, it's really funny because you went all over the world, you talked to schools all over the world, and you found the solution next door. I think that's, um, that's an incredible story. Uh, we also have on the line, uh, Caroline Riadi, representing CLM Hospitals Group, uh, which is the other side of this collaboration. Ibu Caroline, how are you doing today? Not too bad, Rachel. How are you? <laughs> Good, thank you. Excited to be in the presence of a lot of experts. Um, this has been an interesting journey, obviously, from the Espeha side. We'd love to hear your story. Siloam has been a big part of the COVID response in Indonesia as well. Well, you know, uh, when we first heard about the novel virus, we kept a close eye on it and began preparing for it to hit Indonesia. Uh, we had a plan on how we would screen, isolate patients, treat patients. We had a government protocol and we had our tent set up and, and everything. And we were ready, or so we thought we were ready. But when we reflect on uh, the last five months, um, I don't think any could, anything could have prepared us for the challenges, the heartache, the tears that we have experienced. It has been very difficult. Um, the uh, first thing we did was uh, was a, something was a commitment that we made. I remember uh, thinking to myself in March, there was so much unknown about this virus, so much fear about what it could do to our hospitals, to our communities, to the way we live our lives, and thinking, what do we do now? And then I thought, this uh, this too shall pass. The pandemic one day will pass. Will we be passive bystanders or will we be at the forefront living out our vision to bring health and healing to the community? And we chose the latter. And so the first decision we made was to support the government and be at the forefront of the fight against uh, COVID. And then everything else followed, be it putting together a dedicated team of specialists under Dr. Allen, revising the clinical protocol time and time again after discussions with uh, with, uh, with other clinicians and overseas institutions, establishing testing to spearhead uh, diagnosis, uh, establishing treatment and uh, dedicating beds, securing the supply chain, bringing in supplies, flying it in on whatever, la, Garuda, cargo, anybody's private jet coming in. So a lot of work has been done. Uh, and uh, to date, we have tested over 400,000 samples and treated uh, over 3,000 uh, COVID patients. And so with that, as I look back, uh, I think, gosh, we're so thankful because the opportunity that we had to bring hope and healing to our country during this time has been unparalleled. And we have also seen the com the, our country go through an evolution from having very minimal at the beginning to uh, doing not so bad right now. Uh, and so I think we need to appreciate the government as well for uh, what they have done in order to keep the people safe. Thank you. Um, there was something you said that really struck me. You said this pandemic will pass in one way or another. Um, and it is a big test of character, what we do during it and what we, what we do with the time and the opportunity that's been given us. One of the things you're doing with the learnings and with the opportunities, you're consulting with SPH. Uh, I believe Siloam has been consulting with other institutions as well. How did you take the learning from what went on in the hospitals that COVID-19 responds to in these facilities? Yeah, well, you know, uh, when the lockdown happened, I think uh, it was a good thing. Uh, it did slow the spread of the disease and we can see it in the numbers. But then, uh, you know, it's always this trade-off between saving lives and saving livelihoods. And people started to realize that we can't be in lockdown forever. And so when people and companies started coming out of lockdown and resuming activities, they started asking questions around, how do I maintain a safe environment? How, how do I keep myself, my family members, and those in my organization safe? Now, we have have gained so much knowledge around infection transmission and prevention that is invaluable to the public. And this has come from the five months of testing and treating COVID. Remember that COVID is a new virus 
there is still a uh, very limited knowledge on uh, the virus itself. There are uh, a lot of uh, truths that we're trying trying to establish globally. Uh, so it comes from our five months experience with COVID uh, and five months of uh, pro of implementing protocols to protect staff, doctors, and patients against COVID in our hospitals. But it also comes from decades of applying infection control principles in the hospital setting. Like Ibuailin has mentioned, uh, infection control is a big part of what we do. We have patients come in who uh, bring in infections, and some of those infections are uh, multi-drug resistant uh, uh, infections, which means that if you get it, there may not be any antibiotics that are going to be able to cure you from it. And we also have patients come in who, uh, whose uh, immunity has been compromised. So we have to protect those patients. So uh, all this knowledge is very uh, valuable to the public. Uh, and so we have a responsibility to share this because it could keep people safe. Principles are always universal and applicable to different settings. So we have started to advise, consult, and train many of our partners in a number of industries. Uh, education is one, uh, residential housing, airlines, uh, movie theater, hotels, and uh, every time we go into a setting, it's different, but the principles are the same. We just have to see what makes sense in that context. Yeah, yeah. that was a really good point, balancing lives and livelihoods, um, and I can't imagine a facility more complex than a hospital, actually, for that kind of setting, huh? Uh, we actually have one of your team members mm -hmm. here with us. Um, but before we do that, uh, is there anything else that you'd like to share with us? Uh, Boileen mentioned that, look, there's tropical, there's the fact that all these people are coming in and out of our houses. Uh, are those things that make the infectious disease control more complicated? Well, there, uh, if you take a look at where Indonesia is, and we were very scared looking at Italy, and we thought that we would be in Italy. We'd have you know, uh, we'd have uh, sick people all over the streets and deaths to the thousands every day. But the fact of the matter is, Rachel, we haven't seen that in Indonesia and by the, by the grace of God and God willing, <laughs> we won't get, be there. Yeah. I do believe that there are things that uh, have contributed to that. The weather has definitely be, uh, been in our favor, is in our favor. Mm -hmm. Our lifestyle of uh, maybe being more outdoors does play to our favor. And uh, the, the younger average age of our population also plays to our favor. So yes, all these things need to be considered and we cannot take a copy, case, uh, copy paste cookie cutter uh, protocols from uh, another context and apply, uh, just apply them. We have to yeah. see what's relevant and what's not relevant. Yeah, thank you, Caroline. Uh, we actually have on the line, Julie. Julie is a key person in the collaboration between SPH and Siloam Hospitals Group. Uh, Julie, welcome to the call and thank you so much for joining us today. Good morning, Rachel, thank you. Wonderful. Uh, Julie, you are the point person who's been helping make all of this possible. Uh, tell us a little bit about what this consultation engagement with SPH has involved since you're the person on the ground making this happen. Okay, so uh, SPH have been really proactive in seeking us out to provide them with additional knowledge on infection control principles. And the staff wanted to learn what we saw as the risk points in each of their schools and discuss solutions so that they could prepare well in advance of the students returning to school. So the scope of what we covered in our collaboration with SPH uh, included reviewing the school's existing policies and protocols to identify areas that were missing or could be strengthened and a team of five Siloam persons conducted a very comprehensive audit of their facilities. And we looked at their classrooms and all their activity areas. And during the audit, uh, we took the opportunity to teach those infection control principles to the staff, who, as I said, were very willing to learn. And we made lots of recommendations as to how they could minimize their risks in the school. And when we talk about a school, they have many different areas. So we're talking about classrooms, laboratories, the canteen area, sports facilities. It's not just about a classroom, for example. So um, 
we developed up a risk matrix and we gave them a findings table so that they could work on some of the recommendations that we had provided to them. Uh, in addition to that, we provided an intensive 12 hour training session um, and that focused on how to screen and manage people with symptoms of COVID, um, testing uh, uh, participants uh, through that training session so that they knew how to actually conduct proper hand hygiene, providing education on how to disinfect and ventilate areas properly, and teaching the staff how to find and fix risks that they find in the future to reduce cross-contamination and, and cross-infection. So this was uh, some of the things that we did with, have done so far with SPH. Right, I, I still remember being on site, for example, in Lipo Village when I was a student. It was a massive campus. I could run from one end to the other end and you know there were no doors in my way. It was a very wide open campus. That's a very difficult facility to secure, right? Can you give us a few examples of what that has looked like in SPH? Sure. Um, well, some of the recommendations have meant that the schools needed to discuss and review their existing processes and how they're going to change their systems to respond to the new norm that we're now seeing. So that included screening everyone who comes into the school. How many entry points will they open? Uh, what staff will they place at those entry points? What's the process for everyone coming into the school? Reorganising the classroom space uh, because of the social distancing that we want to maintain. Cleaning solutions and cleaning schedules and what they look like now, which are very different to what they used to be. And the student flow around the school, for example, thinking about staggering the, the start time, staggering the break times, and trying to reduce congestion as students move through the school in between classes. So you can see the school's working hard to implement positive change to keep everyone safe. And one example of how the school will implement change is something as simple yet important as uh, making sure that their wash basins and their hand sanitizers are located in the right place. So the principle of hand washing or hand sanitizers is if you don't see it, you won't do it. So the school's reviewing where their sanitizers are currently placed and making changes to ensure that there's enough available and accessible for everybody to use. So that's just one example. Um, and this is an, a significant investment in all that review and change process. And it's for the benefit of everyone who's attending any of their schools. Yeah, okay, wonderful. Julie, I've got a cheeky question to ask. It's actually uh, my personal question. I keep hearing that even air conditioning is um, something that we actually should secure if we're serious about infection control. Is that something that's um, possible to apply in something as complicated as a school? I think in today's world, uh, uh, it's about understanding ventilation. And ventilation is all about airflow. So in the healthcare system, we talk about air exchange, which is how many times per hour a room receives a complete change of fresh air. So you can just imagine uh, that with this airborne virus and, and small particles floating through the air, if you're in a closed space with no ventilation, then everybody's breathing in each other's uh, recirculated air. So simply by creating a cross flow of ventilation, so opening up windows or doors, this will help to freshen up the air in the room. Exhaust fans to pull air out and force air in is one other method that we talked about through the school and uh, air conditioning in houses and in cars is often put on recirculation so that because the air is cooler if it recirculates. However, what you're not doing is pulling in that fresh air. So these are all things to consider when assessing your home and the work environment. And this is what we did as we walked around the school. We looked at every uh, classroom uh, because different sizes, different shapes, different activities that happen in the classroom may, be, may require different uh, methods. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Julie. That uh, sounds very comprehensive. It's not something that would be easy for anyone to pull off if they didn't have that kind of expertise 
uh, in medical infectious disease control. Um, I'd like to turn it back to Wu Eileen. Uh, we also have Wu Eileen's uh, colleague here, uh, Alex Stop, who's also administrative principal in SPH Fluid Village. Between the two of you, look, you're uh, responsible for applying these measures. How have you benefited from the consultation so far? I'll start first. Hi, Rachel. Good morning. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I've been blessed to be part of the CLOAM and SPH consultation uh, process. I've learned so many things throughout the whole process. The consult consultation that CLOAM has given us is very invaluable. Um, one of the topics that I'm impressed the most is the facility audit. Um, Julie explained that a bit. Uh, basically, during the facility audit, the Ceylon team came to our school uh, for one day visit for each school. The whole team went into each of the rooms and um, the process taught us how to assess the room uh, situation and even the setup of the room. Uh, facility audit is not just about Ceylon team coming to our school and assessing each room and helping our store. But uh, the process educate us uh, as the staff that joined that facility audit process. I believe that we learned the skill on how to see things from medical perspective and to understand risks uh, that we might find uh, when we assess a room or something. For example, one of the obvious misconduct, the misconduct, uh, let's say the, we understand that the virus has lifespan on different services. So combined with human behavior, we are looking for example, let's say if you're looking at a stack of paper on the top of the desk in a classroom, uh, sometimes we often clean, when we want to clean the table, we just go around it, you know, but this is not the way we're supposed to be. We were told that we have to tidy up the paper, you know, and then uh, clean it. So what we can learn from the term is we either eliminate the whole thing, uh, tidy up the paper or substitute engineering, uh, how we, uh, what you call it, change our behavior. Uh, or administrative, administrative any situation based on the risk level that occurs. Uh, since the visit and since the report that they write, they wrote and sent it to us and the risk metric that Silvan provided us, we have come so far with molding our staff behavior and habit to structural changes in, from installing fans in a classroom, um, adjusting protocols to obtain equipment as such as a thermal camera in our schools, just to get ourselves ready. I personally feel from the process of uh, auditing facility and then the whole consultation for nearly, I think, six to eight weeks now, uh, I've been able to constantly remind it uh, to apply this important skill uh, to all aspects of my life, not just uh, school and my working uh, place, also at home. So once I enter a room, uh, I look at let's say I look at a couch made of uh, fabric material, uh, which shared by everyone, my thinking is, okay, is this high risk, medium risk or low risk? You know, what should I do with it? Should I eliminate the couch, take it out? And, or, or you know, what should I do with that? Um, the other great thing about the process is we also encourage uh, to constantly find new information from reliable sources. Uh, I'm truly thankful for the process. That's probably what I feel that we benefit the most. Yeah, and with a nice bonus for your personal life as well, since it equips exactly. you for the rest of life. <laughs> yeah, and that's our goal as well for this uh, seminar. Uh, Boiling, do you have anything else to add as to the benefits of the consultation that you've gotten so far? I also have another question for you later about the investment that it's required. <laughs> yeah. Well, sure. I think uh, we all uh, benefited, especially the ones that uh, went through the, uh, the, the program where Siloam trained us. I think the program is called Train the Trainers. Uh, it was, uh, I think we have 30 people in the program uh, and I'm one of them. Uh, it's quite um, thorough in the explanation, meaning that uh, they don't just come and tell us to do this, 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 but they really educate us from the understanding of what actually infectious is, you know, from the, the very basic, because again, we are not, uh, you know, we are not uh, uh, anywhere close to where they are. So they really give us the basic understanding and, uh, you know, teach us about uh, uh, the prevention in a way that uh, it's not uh, like a uh, recipe, but uh, equip us with the knowledge so that we can, um, like Alex say, we, I, I and maybe my friend can go into the, a room now in the school, in the class, 
and uh, our radar is up, then we can start uh, kind of analyzing, uh, you know, like this is the high risk, this is the medium risk, this is the low risk, and, you know, and then again, think what we should do with all these things. For example, books in the library and books in the classroom, you know, what do you do with each of them, where they are in terms of uh, the danger to all this and, and everything, because, you know, books is everywhere in the school, things like that. So they basically, they equip us. So that's, that's what I think uh, I really like. And at the end of the session, one thing that made me realize is uh, I, I do not know anything, but there's an answer. And there's, uh, you know, someone that, uh, a group of people that I can come to. Even now, uh, for example, we just had an event and I can call Julie and say, Julie, is this acceptable? Is this, is this the right way to do things, you know? So I really appreciate that. But in terms of uh, probably emphasizing uh, one out of the many uh, scopes that they cover. Uh, like I said, train the trainers is what actually um, that I like the most. Although I cannot take that out of the whole program. Yeah? I think it's one uh, leading to the other. But for me, it's very beneficial. For our team, it's very beneficial. We understand that in order to, um, to do this uh, safe environment in school or in anywhere, Basically, we need to look at the facilities, if be able to evaluate the facilities and do an SOP, uh, you know, uh, as to what we want to do and how we should uh, manage those things. And the other one is actually human behavior. And that is very important. I mean, simple things like how do you refill uh, disinfectant, for example, you know, uh, is it just uh, we normally uh, rarely empty the bottle and then, you know, fill the new ones, which actually that's the right way. And when is, uh, what, uh, when is the expiration date of this uh, disinfectant? And what kind of disinfectant for what, kind of, uh, for what kind of virus and what kind of services? And how long uh, you know, does the in disinfectant needs to be there in order to kill the germs or the virus? You know, things like that. And also, I think we heard about uh, a lot of uh, uh, information about how to use the mask, but we never, uh, we, I don't think I've heard, uh, anyone tell me how to uh, how to open the mask and how to throw the mask in the in the trash can for example and in the context of school where we have hundreds of people and thousands of people you know if we don't control those maybe those are the the source of the virus so bottom line i think it is very very helpful um and it's not help i mean lockdown is good because uh i was told by carol that the minute indonesia implement lockdown then the number came down but it's not only how, how do we break the chain. I think also the other important thing is how do we make sure that this does not come up again, and especially not within our community. You know, so uh, this I think this teacher train uh, this uh, train the trainers really help us in in uh, in being proactive in terms of preventing this virus to 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 come up again. Yeah. So. That's that's a wide range of things that uh, you've gotten from the consultation. Uh, later, I want to hone in uh, more on the intangibles, things like train the trainer and human habits. Um, but what Alex mentioned earlier, look, you look at a fabric sofa and even that is a risk. You look at a pile of paper, that's a risk. Um, you had to install fans, you had to look at hand washing, disinfectant everywhere. Those are major investments for SPH. Yes. Yes, it is very. Uh, we did. We know that somehow we have to invest. Uh, you know, uh, but we do not know what, and we do not know what is effective, because there are so many people offering us from you know uh, different kind of things: the blue light, the um, the thermometer, different kinds of thermometers, and things like that. But with with the uh, work with Siloam, what I like is they can help us. Uh, evaluate what is needed and where it is needed and uh, at what age of children, uh, you know, uh, and uh, in what uh, traffic area within the school that we needed, you know. So, yes, we want to spend because we do care uh, for the safety of everyone in the school, from the office boy to the vendors to the uh, parents, teachers, you know, everyone. Uh, but we want to make sure that we use the money wisely. Uh, we don't spend on the wrong things, you know. Uh, so, yes, uh, and I'm very interested in, uh, you know, knowing and finalizing uh, our plan in terms of putting exhaust because I was told that there must be a four times fresh air, you know, versus 25 times in a hospital. And then now we have to evaluate each of the room, uh, how many times uh, turn around fresh air, not turn around, but, you know, bringing in fresh air. 
in order for us to to have a healthy healthy place. So in order to do that, we might have to install excess fan, you know, many excess fan and things like that. And maybe in you know at a certain time also open the doors. You know, student might have to have maybe one or two sessions where they don't have air condition, and which to me it's fine because you know children need students need to learn also to adapt. Uh, in this new situation, yeah. But yeah, in terms of investment, uh, it's not going to be small. But yes, we will strive to do uh, the best we can. Great. I think um, a lot of parents are very happy to hear that. Um, that's not something we can uh, replicate in all schools. But one thing that you can share is what you said about train the trainers. That's part of the reason that you decided to share this webinar for the public. Tell us a little bit more about that decision. Okay. After the train the trainers, I realized, like I said, uh, there are two elements, right? The facilities, which has to be taken care of by the people, and the human behavior. Uh, I, you know, if I have to describe this, this is like a uh, like dangerous thing outside us, and we have to close the door as much as we can, right? In order for us to be able to go outside, uh, meaning that uh, we have to to prevent it in our system so we are healthy. Uh, but at the same time, we also have to educate the other people around us so that uh, other, uh, other groups can be, uh, other community can be as healthy. Because in order for us to be healthy, we cannot just think about ourselves. We cannot hibernate our, uh, ourselves or our families. Uh, we have to be able to, uh, to educate, yes, our family members, but also the community. So we will feel safe uh, when they go out. So after the train the trainers, uh, we made a program with, and it's already ongoing where all these trainers now training from the office boy, the, the cleaning service, and then already the teachers and, you know, eventually everybody must own the same understanding <clears throat> and move towards the same, uh, same, same direction. Although everybody will be at different phase and we need to be reminding each other. And the good thing also is still I'm going to come back in three months to evaluate how, you know, we implement this whether we've been strict enough or not, uh, you know, to ourselves. Uh, yeah, but eventually it cannot be just a school. I'm hoping that all the parents uh, of SPH and other parents uh, could, you know, listen to this and, you know, uh, also educate the community. So, uh, yeah, that's, that's the whole goal. And that's why we open this webinar also to the public. And again, I would like to underline that in order for us to take care about our health, we cannot just think about ourselves. We have to uh, go out and uh, educate and help the others so that we can all create a safer environment. I know it's an, uh, not a 100% guarantee, but uh, yes, we can do better than where we are now. Yeah, thank you so much. What I'm hearing from you is health is, look, that's a community, right? That's everyone's right. And it's also everyone's responsibility. Um, there's a lot of people who are gonna be really happy to hear that. And I think where we all feel the same way. Uh, thank you, Ibu Aileen. We also have the honor of having two doctors here. Uh, one, an expert on uh, a pulmonologist, an expert on respiratory diseases, and a pediatrician. So first of all, I'd like to welcome Dr. Allen. Dr. Allen, good day. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. How are you? I'm fine. Thank you, Rachel. Wonderful. Dr. Allen, I think I represent any, everyone when I say thank you so much for all your work. You are a frontliner in the COVID-19 response. Uh, you go through so much to protect so many other people. First of all, tell us, how are you? How has that experience been for you? Okay, thank you very much for the question, sir. Mm -hmm. I have flashed back to the first case on March 20, uh, 2020 when the first COVID-19 patients appeared in Silam Nipo village. It is a quite tense for us because it is quite a situation because we have to admit at the time that none of us in Indonesia especially are really ready to overcome the disease. Uh, at the time, the flow of the patients is also so fast and the new number of cases is keep increasing. And many of them came with, uh, to us with um, mild and moderate symptoms and some of them came with a critical and severe symptom. And what Siloa was doing at the time, so I still remember that the first step is that Siloam did is uh, to build the COVID-19 team of our Siloam hospital. It is around, it was around 30 uh, specialists uh, from the various departments joined the team and we work hand in hand together to save patients. And because we are lack of information as well, and then because this is a new uh, emerging disease that they 
a lot facilitate us to get information from uh, overseas doctors as many as possible by virtual meeting with uh, overseas doctors to share their experience that uh, then we learn uh, the experiences what we can implement it in our hospital and which one is uh, we cannot implement so after that, we try to build the develop uh, uh, SOP or standard procedure for our patient and also for uh, for the health workers. One of the challenging at the time I I remember is uh, the difficulties on how to refer the patients to the referral uh, to the referral hospital, which was reported by government uh, to to taking care for the uh, to taking care of the COVID-19 patients. To anticipate these this situations, the management of Ceylon Hospital under Book Caroline, Riyadi, and also Dr. Grace uh, built emergency tents, so many and containers to accommodate the patients. But at the same time, they are also preparing Kelapa Dua Ceylon Hospitals as our transit hospital before we can refer them to the genuine rest of to the genuine uh, uh, River Hospital at the time. And by God's grace, finally, Ceylon Papadua was appointed by government uh, to be one of the River Hospital in Banten province, which dedicated for COVID-19 until now. Another challenging that I still remember is so many patients come with a, a lack of oxygen in their body because they didn't realize it at all. So we call it the, the, the disease, is, uh, the, we call it the symptoms as a happy hypoxemia. So for those kind of patients, uh, we transfer them directly go to ICU and observe them and to monitor them and to see the deterioration of the patients. Uh, it is not easy, I want to tell you that it is not easy to handle this disease, uh, especially when the, uh, when the patients comes to a critical point that because you can uh, you know that this, this disease can mimic any other disease so we can call this disease uh, with a thousand phase disease so uh, another reason because uh, this is a new disease which everybody in the world are also still still struggling to find out what is the etiology what is exactly the pathogenesis of the disease what is the complication? What is the best therapy or management of this disease? And also, what is the prevention? So the research also could not give us a speedy information about uh, about our necessities at the time. So uh, that is a very tense moment at the time. But uh, besides the tense moment, I think that uh, we have also a very uh, happy moment and uh, many of happy moments, especially when we saw our patient cured and recovery for from the disease and they are going home safely and uh, get uh, and uh, gather together with the family uh, uh, with a happy face uh, you know this is a, a feeling is in unpayable for us and besides of this happy moment we also experience what we call as a blessing moment because we have four baby birth and epsilon kelapa uh, dua coming from the pregnant woman, pregnant mother who's suffering COVID-19 and all the babies were delivered safely and they are in good conditions until they went home and recognized as a recovery patient. So up to now, uh, we, were, we have taken around uh, 500 uh, patients and uh, there are around uh, 62 to 65 patients were in the ICU room until, until now. And the total percentage of the death is 4.3% uh, for the total amount of the patients. And in ICU room itself is around 30 patients. We thank God for this uh, achievement because um, only by the God grace we are uh, we, we began to understand and begin to cope and understand what happened and what, what is the characteristic, uh, characteristic uh, of the virus uh, so we can reduce the mortality, especially in ICU room. Yeah.
Thank you so much, doctor. So many, um, I can't imagine the number of stories that you have about fighting COVID. Thank you so much. Um, one thing, it, you're a highly respected healthcare professional in this area. You mentioned earlier, it's such a new disease that people know very little about it. What can we do as laymen, Dr. Allen? Uh, we get news every day from WhatsApp, from Facebook, from our friends about new inventions, new cures, new things, this and that. How do we tell apart uh, what's true and what's not? Okay, thank you for your question. This is a very uh, important question, uh, Rachel, because you know that the proliferation of fake news about COVID-19 pandemic has been labeled as a dangerous infodemic. Yeah. Uh, the fake news spread very fast and more easily today through all the social media, internet, and also instant messaging. So sometimes the fake news can also mixture with the correct information and it is make, make us more difficult to point out what is true and what is not true. So to differentiate which news are fake and which are not, there are some tips from, uh, I read from uh, Oxford University published on March 2020. There are some things about uh, how to uh, be aware about the news. The first one is you have to know the source. You have to question the source when you when you uh, receive the, the news. Check on the official website if the stories are repeated there. Uh, the second one is you can see the logo. Check whether any organization logo used in the message uh, looks the same, the same as the official logo. And you can also see the uh, bahasa, yeah, bahasa language. Uh, if they use English, uh, uh, there is no bad English. I think that uh, if if the uh, organization, uh, credible organization and credible journalists are less likely to make, uh, um, you know, repeated spelling or grammar uh, mistakes. So you can check from that. Uh, to differentiate what is fake and what, what is true. And also, if you find a message which uh, over encouragement to share message, so this message presses you to share to everybody, uh, this is also have to be suspicious as a, a fake message. And we, uh, we can use, uh, I, I, I want to uh, ask you to use fact checking website, yeah, because these are some search engine machine that you can find through the computer and they can uh, differentiate and they, they can could be used to look up the title of the articles to see if it has been identified, identified as fake message or, uh, or not. So this is a very uh, important point to, uh, to, uh, to, to be pointed. So who, who to trust? Yeah, who to trust in here? So the best source is to be trusted. I think that is to get health information. I think is the best sources is from your government website, official website, also from the government uh, social media. And also we know about CDC website, uh, WHO web website, and also reputable journal. It is, it is very important uh, sources that you have to know. But I know with the community, maybe you are too complicated to, you, you feel that, you think that it is too complicated to understand. Yes, I, I understand that because all of those kind of things there is a, a use the medical terminology, so it is hard for you to understand. So you can go to, go, uh, you can follow through the, like a seminar, uh, seminar awam, we call it for community. Uh, it's held by, uh, Credible and also by the reliable university or institution like what we have done now uh, from STH, UPH, and Ceylon Hospital, and maybe any other university or institution, either national or international. So I think that uh, we have to think twice yeah, about the message currently circulating because it will be uh, it it will make a huge impact to our life. Uh, a negative impact if the news are fake. So the second one, I think that we have, we have to help to guide our children and also our family and also our friends to decide what and whom to trust. That's all about the, uh, the questions, Rachel. Yeah, thank you so much, doctor. And the reason why we're paying such close attention to these messages is we're so eager 
to protect our homes and our kids. Uh, what advice do you have for minimizing COVID-19 risk in our homes and in our daily lives? Okay, thank you very much. Before I go to your question, I want to share a little bit about um, knowledge about uh, how, how the COVID-19 spread, okay? So we have known in the beginning that SARS-CoV-2 is spread uh, through the direct contact and also droplets. But currently, the letter on uh, WHO on mid of July, if I'm not wrong, announced that it can also be spread by uh, through the air, and we call it as a airborne transmission. Uh, when somebody is sneezing or coughing, he or she will generate three sizes of droplets. The first one is below five microns. This is the very small droplets and can be suspended in the air. The second one is the larger droplets. It's much more uh, 100 uh, micron, and we consider it as a large droplet. And the third one is the between 5 to uh, 100 microns, and we call it uh, intermediate droplets. And why we have to know about this, those kind of things of size of droplets and what happened to those droplets? Uh, we have to know because Due to gravitation of forces, the particles that are bigger than five microns being forces by gravitation and tend to fall down on surface. And within six feet of distance, this is the basic why CDC uh, determines six feet for sexual distancing. And when somebody is breathing heavily, like you do exercise, you shouting, sneezing, coughing, or even singing, then the droplet can fly up to 12 feet. And um, at the same time, some tiny or micro droplets, we call it micro droplets, could be also generated. So these tiny particles do not move as a ballistics, you know. They act more like gases. So they float in the air and then they can travel up uh, 27 feet. It's around eight meters. Then we call uh, this phenomenon as an airborne transmission. And because of this, we come up with a new guideline. The WHO come up with improve the guideline that the people should avoid crowd and to ensure good ventilation in building and addition to social distancing and have to use masks. So based on this, uh, we 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 have to ask ourselves how to prevent ourselves to get COVID-19. So there are some strategies. The, the first one is hand washing. We heard a lot about hand hygiene. Uh, the second one is avoid touching your face. It is also you know about that. And also social distancing. This is also familiar for us since the beginning. But maybe that is not familiar for us is the respiratory hygiene. What is kind of respiratory hygiene? I mean that respiratory hygiene is the simple things that uh, can be implemented to everyone yeah, to avoid COVID-19. The first one is you have to cover your mouth with tissue, not your hand, when you're coughing and sneezing. And use the, the nearest waste bin to dispose of the tissue after use. Yeah. And the perform hand hygiene, wash your hands right away after you touch your tissue. And another uh, uh, issue uh, is the gargling. So maybe you know about the PPP, I, I don't, uh, Rachel, uh, you know that uh, it is a very massive information currently about how we have to uh, uh, use uh, better, the, uh, not better, Povidon Iden, uh, Povidon Iden uh, to kill SARS-CoV-2. I want to uh, share with you that this is the correct uh, information because Povidon-Iden can kill SARS-CoV-2 uh, around 99 to 99% in 30 seconds. It's based on in vitro research from uh, Duke and UH. So 99.99% uh, 99, uh, 99 uh, this is a determined efficacy of the antiseptic and disinfection. Uh, disinfection. So it's if there is an antiseptic will kill 99 to 99% of virus, it was categorized as a good antiseptic. So according to COVID-19, we know that the place which was, we can find a very high viral, viral load is in your body, is 
in your nasal pharynx and oropharynx. So it's good for the patient and healthcare, work, uh, healthcare uh, workers to gargle with PPPI and with a certain concentration of corn to eliminate and to prevent SARS-CoV-2 uh, get into your body. And there are a lot, uh, a lot of previous study about about this uh, PPPI. Uh, it was used other. Uh, it was used also in other outbreaks, such as if you still remember MERS, COVID, SARS, and also Ebola. Uh, this study showed so many uh, usage uh, of PPPI uh, to decreasing the risk of cross infection between public health worker and uh, also the patients. So uh, in the new normal era, it is expected for everyone or us can do the new habit as well by gargling PPPI or other recommended antiseptic to prevent and break the chain of transmission of COVID-19. Some of them also use on the normal line uh, uh, 0.5% to, to wash the, the throat. Uh, that's all information about how to uh, prevent yourself to get uh, COVID-19, Rachel. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Allen. So many little things we can do to really protect ourselves. Thank you for your time and for those answers. I want to turn now to Dr. Yogi. Uh, Dr. Yogi is your colleague. Uh, Selamat siang, Dr. Yogi. How are you? I'm fine. Thank you, Rachel. It's good to have you on the call. Thank you for joining us. Dr. Yogi, you're also a frontliner specifically when it comes to caring for children. Um, I've got a key question, which is, as a pediatrician, what have you learned about COVID-19 that maybe parents are not aware of when it comes to protecting their children? Well, actually, this is a novel virus. Uh, no doctors, I see no doctors uh, have already started doing their medical training. So we have a good talk here. Uh, all doctors around the world and the uh, virus is trying to uh, Dr. Yogi, Dr. Yogi, sorry to interrupt. I think we need you a little bit closer to the mic. Thank you. Oh, sorry, sorry. Okay. So basically, the information is uh, rapidly changing and evolving, right? So um, we, we need to learn every day. We need to update our information uh, about this virus. One thing, this is not mainly a respiratory disease. This is an infectious disease. So the main issue is how to stop the transmission. So, so for parents, uh, I'm going to make it simple. There are three do's and three don'ts that uh, you need to encourage you. The three do's is, uh, the first one is face mask, the second one is hand washing, and the third one is safe distance. Uh, in order to make this virus stop, uh, you know, infected others, stop the transmission, you need to wear the face mask properly. And then about the hand washing, try to, be more playful when you teach your child uh, to do this hand washing according to the WHO around 20 seconds. Uh, there are a lot of uh, song uh, about it. I even told my three years old son and he can do it properly. And for the safe distance, you know, it's not one meter, it's around six feet. So around uh, about two meters here. Yeah. You have to keep a safe distance yeah. and you have, you have to repeat it over and over to make it a habit. And how about the three don'ts? The first one, uh, you have to be responsible. Don't go outside when you feel unwell. It was when the local transmission is there. You don't know whether you, you, uh, uh, you have the disease or not. So don't go outside when you feel unwell. And the second one, don't go to the contained environment. Yeah? Don't go, this is the second one. Contained environment, crowded places, and close conversations. Yeah? We know that the natural ventilation is the best. Yeah? So uh, you don't uh, uh, close your, uh, your windows and doors uh, during uh, the day. You have to uh, have the natural ventilation in and out. Yeah. You have to avoid the crowded places. Uh, there's, uh, if you don't go uh, bring your child to school, but you bring your child, your child to the mall, to the cinema, it's, uh, it's, it's uh, no use here yeah, because it's all crowded there. And then for the close uh, conversations, if you need to speak to others yeah, more than 15, minutes yeah, less than one meters then probably you need it uh doing, doing it online yeah. you, you need it doing like a teleconsultation and so on so whenever you bring a child to vaccinate your child maybe it's better you have a, a teleconsultation first if you need to ask various questions and then you go there get a shot and then you go back uh, no need to have a 
uh, a long duration of uh, conversations. Yeah? And then uh, the last, the last one is don't touch. Yeah? You don't touch the outer layer of your mask yeah? because that's the one that is infectious. You don't touch your face, you don't touch your uh, eyes, your nose, and your mouth. Yeah? So the three things and three dots. Uh, that's the we have to encourage. Thank you so much, Dr. Yogi. I think for the benefit of everyone on the call, the gargle that Dr. Allen mentioned was providone iodine. Uh, we'll write that down again in the group chat for you. The three do's and the three don'ts, uh, test my knowledge, Dr. Yogi. The three do's are uh, wear your face mask, wash your hands frequently, uh, practice safe distancing. Uh, the don'ts are look, keep away, uh, uh, don't go out if you're unwell, stay away from crowded places, uh, and limit touching right, of, of your face. Is that right? Did I get it right? The three don'ts. The second one, uh, you don't uh, uh, go to the contained environment. So the meaning, contained environment, okay. Like close, have a, uh, uh, you know, like uh, only like a, a circulated air, you know. Yes, to the point earlier. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you so much, doctor. Uh, look, I do have um, a further question. We want to keep our children safe, but we can't keep them indoors forever. Um, that would have a really big effect on their mental health. Do you have any advice for us, Dr. Yogi? Yeah, you know, children, basically, they are a great imitator. They might not listen to you, but they will definitely copy uh, of what you do. So uh, first thing, uh, don't be paranoia. Uh, don't show, like, uh, extremely afraid of everything. But also, don't be ignorant. Yeah. If you ever uh, see a movie, a Lucky Tabela, maybe some of you already see that movie, yeah. Life is Beautiful, uh, it's a post-protocolic uh, movie. So. It's about a family that live in a concentration camp, a Nazi concentration camp. They know how hard it is. But the father, uh, he tried his best to explain everything in a playful manner so the, father, the child feels safe in that uh, concentration camp. Yeah. So maybe uh, that's uh, the issue. Yeah. We have to make it uh, our child give information uh, in a playful manner, especially for the little ones. How about for the school age children and teenagers? Yeah. You know, uh, for them, uh, the number one rule, honesty is the best policy. Yeah. You have to be honest. You have to ask them and try to listen. Listen to them. Listen to what they are thinking. Yeah. Sometimes uh, it will shock you that they, they, sometimes they overthink. They, uh, like I have a teenager yeah, and uh, when I need to go outside to the hospital, and then sometimes he thinks, why, why you have to go outside? You know, if, uh, if you get infected with COVID-19, you can get in ICU and you can uh, also infect, infect us. And so, so you have to explain like, like that. Yeah. You have to be honest uh, to them. Thank you, Dr. Yogi. Those are very valuable advice for children of all ages. Uh, they really look to their parents for the security and, and the way to manage this with joy. You know, um, also, you have to learn from uh, reliable resources here. Yeah. Really, yeah. reliable resources. That's very important. Yeah. You have to know that not everybody that wearing a white coat is a legitimate, legitimate doctor. Yeah? You know, uh, the viral videos, I think already uh, seen by a lot of people, yeah? uh, so-called uh, frontliners, American doctors, they told you uh, no, no need to wear a mask and there's already a cure for this disease. Yeah? Uh, so that is not a valid argument. That is not a scientific argument. Always base your act on a scientific reason. Another reminder to parents to make sure that you're turning to reliable information, that you're sharing that with your children and that you're modeling it, yeah. Uh, I've got another question, uh, Dr. Yogi, as we bring this back to the context of schools. Are children at greater risk of COVID-19? Uh, if we were to send them back into schools, uh, another question that we get is, is it true that they can carry greater viral loads without getting sick and that they could bring it back home? What's your thoughts on this? Yes, statistically, uh, statistically. Actually, in Indonesia, we have around 2 to 4% mortality rates in children. So, some of you might say it's relatively a small number. But for us, for clinician, it's, it is never, never just a number. Because when one child gets sick or even uh, have to be admitted to a critical care, the family members will affect it. So, it's, it is never, never just numbers. And uh, you don't. Uh, uh, try to compare it with the adult mortality. Let's say adult mortality, or it's uh, in a uh, elderly, it's from 30, 40 percent. The child mortality is only two to four percent. No, you compare it with other countries in the same uh, age uh, groups. Yeah. 
So based on WHO, our child mortality is highest in the Pacific region because some country is less than 1%. Yeah, so this is an issue. Uh, so basically, uh, we have to really, really see this as a whole picture. Indonesia, we have a double burden. Before the pandemic, pneumonia already uh, is a number one cause of mortality in Indonesia. So after the pandemic, so you know that uh, the, the, the virus strikes for the respiratory system, so sometimes it can show up as a pneumonia and uh, all that thing. And another thing is about the vaccination. Uh, maybe as a school, you have to encourage the parents to vaccinate their child. Yeah? Because our vaccination rates is dropping. Parents are uh, scared to bring their child, to vaccinate their child. If this is still happening after the pandemic, we will have an epidemic of uh, diseases that we can prevent, like diphtheria, tetanus, polio, pertussis, tuberculosis. So, so make sure you have to vaccinate uh, the child. Uh, another issue is uh, uh, maybe it, it is true that most of the children that are infected with COVID-19 will have a asymptomatic or have a mild disease. Yeah? But uh, they can also be uh, the transmitter. Yeah. So uh, they will uh, drive it spread. Yeah. Because uh, there's one uh, study here yeah, shows that children from age five to seventeen years of age they might be as contagious as adults. Yeah. So whenever in your area the uh, transmission, the local transmission is still high, not not very too high, it is uh, really unwise to open the school. Thank you, Dr. Yogi. That was a very important reminder to make sure that your children are vaccinated again to make sure you're listening to reliable sources of information as well. Dr. Yogi, thank you so much for your insight specifically around caring for our children. Um, again, when it comes to returning to the school facility, I'd like to invite Julie back onto the uh, center stage here. Um, Julie, you're applying all of these learnings to schools. What advice do you have for us at home about how we can protect our families? Well, I think you've all heard how we need to implement those defences. And it's not just one defence, it's all together. So each defence that we've talked about today, wearing a mask, hand washing, social distancing, how we clean and disinfect our, our environments, these, are, these come together as the whole strategy. So one strategy alone is not going to work. And, and I think that this is a, a key message of today for the parents. So all of these defences rely on your individual behaviours. No one is used to wearing a mask in the past. However, look at us now. That didn't take long for us to, to learn that behaviour. Uh, social distancing, it's a very foreign concept for us when we're so used to hugging and kissing and shaking hands. But we have undertaken this behaviour because we know it's one of the defence mechanisms that will work for us. So <clears throat> the research shows that behaviours begin at home. And so take an inward look at your home situation. So uh, let's look at hand washing. Hand washing is a behaviour that's learned at a very early age. Reminding your children to wash their hands before they eat or after the bathroom, this is a learned behaviour. And for those children who have not learned this behaviour as intensely as others, then it might be time to do some reteaching. So then you instill a stronger behaviour. As parents and with our own, within our own family uh, groups and circles, it's important to have the conversation and agree on what is your new family norm? Why are you implementing this new family norm? And then as Dr. Yogi mentioned, use different ways to get that behavior change and, and, and the kids thinking. So those playful or, or creative ways to get the understanding of the whole family and then monitoring it. You know, it doesn't have to be all doom and gloom and serious. It could be a competition between the family members that creates that new way of thinking and that, that strength and behaviour. So I think uh, uh, for, for all of us, it is a lesson to, to 
uh, look inward and do some reflection about what's happening within our family environment and then to work out those new and creative ways to determine what we think uh, should be our new family norm and how we're going to instill it. Thank you so much, Julie. I think that's just really valuable advice for all the families here. That's the big picture of how we can change our habits for the better. Um, well, Caroline, you are also, um, you're a mom, you're an educator, and you're a healthcare professional. What advice do you have in addition to what we've heard so far? How do we live and balance between being careful uh, and living the fullest life possible with our children? Well, I think we have, uh, we have heard a lot of information but we have to act on that information. So we have to make a judgment call. And just like in the beginning of the pandemic, uh, we made a commitment that we would go all out and be at the forefront in supporting the government to fight against COVID. I think we all need to make a commitment now that we will embrace the new normal because we have no choice. New normal presents new risks, but we have a high degree of control towards those risks. And we believe that the new normal can be done safely. And this is why we're having all these events. Otherwise, we just tell everybody just to stay at home if we don't believe that it can be done safely. Uh, and it starts with a proper understanding of infection transmission and prevention, creates the awareness, and then leads to the right behaviors. A lot has been said about seeking accurate information from reliable sources, and also changes in behavior and to your environment has to be sustainable, which means it has to be something that you're ready to do over a longer period of time. Uh, when the pandemic uh, first broke up, out, everybody rushed to get N95s, which then they found out is not relatively available, it's expensive, and if you've actually worn it and worn it properly, then you'll also realize that it's not so easy to breathe in that N95 mask, and if you are breathing uh, without difficulty in the N95 mask, that means that you've put it on wrong. <laughs> You know, now when it comes to our children, there's nothing that we want to protect more. Um, and being a mother of four, I understand this as well, but the way to protect them isn't by keeping them at home forever. We need to be properly informed so we can give them the right understanding because they're gonna want to know why. Why do I need to wear a mask now? Why can't I have my birthday party and invite all my friends? And just as we educate our children about the dangers of crossing the road, the dangers of getting into bad company or, uh, or getting lost in the mall, this is something, it's the same thing. We will educate them on the dangers of the new normal and how they can protect themselves. When my children come out of a bathroom, I always ask them two questions and have been for many years. And uh, they know that question number one is, did you wash? Question number two is, was it with soap? And so this is part of forming the habit and it takes about 90 days in order for that habit to solidify. And so we have to be consistent throughout those 90 days, but giving them the proper understanding that they can internalize will make this behavior sustainable and support good judgment making. So there's one time then we were out riding bicycles with my, with my children and we saw other people riding bicycles and they had a face mask on. And so they said, ma, I think the face mask isn't necessary because you're not going to be close enough to uh, to be at risk that you would need the face mask mask. So this told me that they had internalized the concepts of uh, why wear a face mask. How do you uh, prevent? Uh, how would it help you? So very pleased ab about that. I have started allowing my children to go out. Uh, they go to grandma's. Uh, they go to some of their lessons where I know uh, they have taken the necessary precautions at those centers, and we trust that our children know what is safe behavior and are applying them when they're outside the home. And so I think that uh, more and more people will, will do this, and it'll be a, a habit for them growing up, and they will have a much higher awareness of infections and uh, pathogens in, the, in their environment than we ever did growing up. So, um, and that's just the way it has to be. Thank and you so to much. teach them to uh, trust God too. I mean, uh, the, the, my children know about the, the dangers of the virus and that we can be safe, but uh, they also know that I go to the hospital frequently and they pray for me and they pray 
for the doctors and the nurses. And so I think it is also a way for us, it is a teachable moment, uh, uh, an opportunity for us to also discuss with our children on how to be responsible in our behaviors, but also how to trust God in uh, uncertain situations. And this is a unique opportunity that as parents, we should take. Thank you so much, Caroline. Um, thank you to everyone who is attending today. We will go into the question and answer soon. Uh, but before we do that, I just want to remind you again, I hope that you are gaining a lot of confidence from all the um, speakers that we have here today. Uh, I hope you have more information than you did before. But before we close off, uh, Ibu Aileen, uh, you are not just a parent, you're also a grandparent. And beyond being an educator, you have a heart for helping parents do the best that they can. Do you have any last words of advice for us before we go into Q&A? Sure. Um, well, I would first uh, like to thank Siloam for sharing uh, all the information and helping us in this. And I just want to uh, give you, uh, let you know that how many people are blessed just uh, because the last uh, three, three days ago, uh, we had a graduation where uh, we have 60, uh, 63 students and parents attended and it went well in my opinion, meaning that uh, it is a God honoring event yet uh, with the limitation we can celebrate God's goodness. Uh, everybody feels safe, everybody knows the protocol. Uh, we were given special permit and checked by the government, we feel at peace. Uh, not to say that we can eliminate everything and make it as the safest place, uh, but uh, I think uh, from the human perspective, I felt like uh, we've tried our best and uh, parents uh, feel that way too and we're very blessed. So I just want to let also uh, thank Siloam team and share that uh, joyful moment to you. Uh, and to parents, I think um, we have to remind ourselves that uh, we are called to raise and develop new generation in order for them to be able to live a life that brings glory to him. Uh, you know, uh, by bringing the brokenness of the world back to its original purpose. And, uh, you know, uh, to do that is not easy. Academic will not be sufficient. If we just equip them with academic, that will not be sufficient for them to live in the real life. The challenge is so much greater, as much as we don't like them to experience and uh, experience the effect of uh, COVID-19. Uh, but I think I agree with Carol, this is a teachable moment. So let's not uh, throw this opportunity away. I do not want to underestimate the suffering that people have gone through. Uh, you know, uh, for example, if there's, uh, there was family uh, death in the family and things like that, it is horrible. But, uh, you know, uh, I don't want to underestimate the pain that they are going through, but I just want to encourage that uh, let's move on together. Uh, let's move on to build our community uh, to build the people around us to really be a blessing to this country. And uh, yeah, there are many things that our country is not doing if we make comparison to other country. But, you know, every country is different. So let's just do what we can do in our family, in our, in our community, uh, within the capacity that you have. So, and uh, again, may through this uh, COVID-19 season, our children, grow into a better person, more resilient, uh, more responsible, more flexible, yet not comprom uh, compromising uh, in some of the values uh, and uh, you know, in, in their life. So again, uh, let's make the best use and continue to bring them closer to God, to be dependent and to again, ask God what uh, he wants each of them to do during this COVID-19 season. So that's my uh, closing remarks, thank you. Thank you, Ibu Eileen. Thank you to all our speakers, Ibu Caroline, uh, Alex, Julie. We have Dr. Allen, Dr. Yogi. Thank you so much for your time for all of us today. Uh, even though you're at home, I hope you can join me in giving them a round of applause. Uh, and we'll now enter into the question and answer session. Thank you to everyone who submitted your questions. We've tried to prioritize frequently asked questions. Let me begin with the first one. This is to SPH, so to Ibu Eileen and Alex. What are the driving factors that have driven you to decide between opening the school, at-home learning, or a combination or hybrid of the two? Uh, well, um, like I said earlier, uh, the minute we are on holiday, we were on holiday in June, 
uh, we already start planning A, B, and B, A, B, and C. Honestly, it's very hard to predict. First, I think it has to be approved by government. Uh, you know, now there's still debate between uh, the zoning, whether the zoning is, is useful enough because some people say it's not the zoning of the school that's important. It's the zoning of uh, where the students come from, right? So there's still a debate on that. Uh, but we will follow uh, the guidelines of the government. Uh, we will also uh, make sure that uh, some of the Siloam IPC uh, program uh, can be implemented well with the SOP and the understanding. And uh, our teachers are already with uh, plan A, B, and C. Um, so, so those are probably the three factors that will determine the opening of the school. Thank you. I hope that gives uh, parents here comfort, especially parents of SPH. Uh, our next question is to Dr. Allen. Dr. Allen, what should be uh, our hope and expectation regarding COVID in the future? Uh, is it that the virus will dwindle? Is it that there will be a vaccine ready? Uh, when will that vaccine be ready? What should we expect about COVID-19 in the future? So I think the pandemic is still going on and we cannot uh, expect that the virus is zero in, in the world. So I think that the new norm protocol uh, you have to be implemented in your daily life and also the vaccine we are waiting for the vaccine now the vaccine is in Indonesia right now but it is still on the clinical phase three it means that uh, we are still waiting for the research of what is the side effect uh, of the vaccine and after that maybe on January 2000, uh, 2021 uh, is uh, the vaccine can be released. Thank you, Dr. Allen. That's not too far away, but a little too far for our, um, for our preferences. Uh, this is a question again to SPH. How will you make sure that teachers and staff are protected uh, as and when the school reopens? Will it be a partial reopening? Will it be a certain percentage? And how do you make sure, um, how, do you cert um, how do you protect them, especially in closed buildings? Maybe Alex or, or, or Julie have a response to that one? Um, I think that we have developed with the school a lot of management processes through our uh, information gathering uh, when we visited every school. So looking at all the screening processes or the classrooms or the way that they manage the whole flow of a student through the school, the teachers through the school, um, uh, we've been able to help the school develop um, a lot of new protocols and strengthen some existing ones so that we feel confident that the school has an understanding of what they must do to keep um, everyone who's coming to the school uh, safe. The, the assumption there is that everyone coming to the school is accountable, that they take on that responsibility and accountability to make sure that they don't come to the school sick, they don't send their children to the school if, the, if their children are sick, and they communicate uh, what's going on if, if the children or, or teachers uh, can't come to the school. So I think uh, there has to be a shared responsibility from the public, from whoever comes to the school and those within the school to make sure that the, that safety is all rounded and uh, sustainable. And if I may add something that uh, we have been doing training uh, with our trainers to all community of the school. Right now we are, I think for the past week, uh, we're having um, our admin staff, our field staff, our teachers taking those training, you know, being um, given the knowledge of how to take care of themselves, how to take care of the others. I, I like the idea that, um, you know, when we say uh, how the school protect teachers and stuff, but I feel like it's everybody's responsibility. It's not like the school protecting the teachers, the staff or student or parents, but everyone must take their part, take care of each other, take care of themselves. Um, that's what I learned from the training, exactly. That's brilliant. And that's a great segue to my next question because someone is asking, could you explain in more detail what it means to prepare the school for reopening? Um, whether it's turning off the AC and where would we, people in the audience, ask help to get trained? 
uh, who should be answering? Okay. Well, Anyone? Uh, yeah. okay. Well, from the school, um, you know, we will make SOP, not only just train people, but we will make, make SOP. And we will allow, not allow, but this is part of the contract. We want Siloam to evaluate us after three months and see uh, how we do. So I cannot go point by point what we will do. I think uh, we will inform the parents once we are ready with the SOP and the guidelines. Um, so, so yeah, that's from the school perspective. I think from the training perspective, uh, from the training perspective, uh, if uh, you're interested in having additional training, please contact uh, the school. I think there's going to be something set up, Ibu Eileen. Yes, yes, we will. Hopefully, Siloam uh, will uh, send their, uh, your people to train our parents as well, yeah, in a more depth uh, level than what we can do as uh, the new trainers. Yeah, so one of the things that we're thinking about is having half day training for parents if uh, there is a demand there. And I think that uh, the SPHA team are going to gather information about the demand from parents and that could be in any of the schools. We're talking about Chikarang or Sentul or Karawachi, any of the school areas. Uh, we're willing to go out and conduct training uh, on the school campus um, to parents. Brilliant. Something to look forward to. The next stage of the collaboration and more uh, public information about that. Uh, I have a related question, and this is to Dr. Yogi and to Espeha. You mentioned uh, you agreed that kids can carry a high viral load without being sick. Uh, in the context of the school, will you be testing your teachers or your staff and the kids uh, so that we avoid transmission back to their parents or grandparents? Maybe uh, Dr. Yu, yeah? okay. oh, Go ahead, go ahead. No, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Thank you for the questions. Uh, so, uh, basically, uh, I'm sorry, I'm putting a face mask because there's somebody in the room with me. So I have to go to the face mask. So basically, uh, they are, the first rule is uh, whether the transmission, the local transmission, is already um, a container or not. Yeah. Is it already? Uh, so you, you have to know that uh, whenever your government um, uh, shows a, da a data, yeah, uh, today we have like a hundred or a thousand patients uh, with confirmed COVID-19. We don't only look at those data, but we also have to look for the positivity rate here. The positivity rate meaning in one day, let's say in Jakarta, uh, they test uh, for a hundred uh, person, and then the positive is below five person. Then means the local transmissions already uh, already uh, contained here. Uh, if it's more than 5%, yeah, uh, so uh, our initial data is about 13 to 14% the positivity rate, meaning it's, it, it's not, it, is, it, is, it is still not under control. So whenever you uh, want to have a, like this uh, gathering, and it's, it is like an ongoing, uh, maybe uh, doing a, a, a swap, uh, it's a good idea. I know there's uh, there's uh, one study in New South Wales. Yeah? There are 15 schools there. Uh, when when they open up the, their school, uh, they have a informed consent from their parents. Yeah. So uh, these 15 schools is like a pilot project. Uh, before they open, they do a swap, and in uh, during uh, after a month, they repeat the swap. Uh, then they will know uh, which. Uh, of uh, the students or the teachers get infected in the school area. Uh, so uh, there's a lot of things uh, that need to be think uh, and uh, have a detailed, uh, uh, you know, like contingency plan whenever this happens. But the issue is uh, the local transmission. That's the main issue. If the local transmission is already low, meaning uh, they have already contained the virus, then uh, Maybe we can talk about this uh, PCR in a more uh, soft manner. Silakan, Ibu Aileen, you have a comment? Yeah. All right. I guess from from the school, 
uh, we are still working on it. I cannot give you an answer right now. We do have uh, several plans depending on the condition when we open the school at that time. But uh, so I, I cannot promise whether it's swap or serology, but we do make uh, we do we will do make some kind of a uh, prevention. Uh, at this moment, all of our teachers who came from uh, America and uh, different places, Australia, uh, they have to stay quarantined for 14 days. And prior to that, they did take the PCR test, uh, you know, before leaving the country. But they still have to do home, uh, you know, uh, isolation. Uh, so that's all that I can update. But for sure, we will uh, uh, move towards the direction of what is the safest. Thank you, Ibuailin. Um, the medical information on this is ever evolving, but we trust that the school has the help of Siloam and that you'll make the right decisions when the time comes. Uh, I respect your time, uh, our speakers and our attendees on the call. So we have one last question, uh, and this question is to Caroline uh, and her colleagues at Siloam. The question is, what do these what do you think about the COVID situation in Indonesia as leaders and experts in the medical field? How will the situation develop? What's the trend? What is your estimate? Uh, what will be what will it be like in the following months and into 2021? Maybe Caroline, you'd like to start off. Yes, yeah, sure. Thank you, uh, Rachel. Um, I think that uh, when we talk about uh, the what is the trend, probably a few things to note. I think that uh, one is people are noticing that the number of positive cases are still increasing every day and still increasing at an alarming rate. So that's one way to look at it. Another way to look at it is what is the speed of it increasing? And when you uh, take a look at the speed, that means uh, that globally what is measured is what we call the rate of doubling. How long does it take for the numbers to become double of what it is today. And so uh, how long does it take it from getting from four to eight, from eight to 16, et cetera. Indonesia is right now at uh, 44 days. Now, just to give you a comparison on uh, what all the other countries are, uh, I mean, India now is at 26. So, I mean, it, it's doubling very fast. Uh, and countries like the UK is now at 82 days. So they're doubling much longer than uh, we are. So we are still doubling, but that rate of doubling has gone up and it continues to go up from week to week. That means it tells us that the spread is slowing. Although the uh, number of absolute uh, cases is increasing from day to day. Now, the second thing that I wanted to uh, touch on that I mentioned just really briefly before is that Indonesia is not where it was four or five months ago. It is far from where it is. Uh, when we began, we had very little testing capabilities. There were not a lot of hospitals able to take COVID, and that has changed. And so uh, I think that Indonesia has a testing capability of, Dr. Ellen, please correct me if I'm wrong, yeah, somewhere between 15 to 20,000 uh, samples a day. Uh, that's on, on testing. On treatment, uh, we used to be a, a huge amount of the cases being admitted. We used to admit, uh, we were treating 13% of all the cases in Indonesia, which is a big chunk because a lot of people weren't. Now we're only treating about 2%, which tells us that everybody else has increased capacity. And therefore, the recovery rate for Indonesia is way better. It, in the beginning, it used to be at like 20%. And now we're at the, the death uh, to discharge rate. But now it's at a 7%, which is in line with a lot of other countries. So we're, we're actually not bad in Indonesia. Yeah. Thank you, Caroline. Dr. Allen, Dr. Yogi, any other thoughts that you'd like to add to this question? Good. I think it's not for me. Wonderful. Thank you so much once again. Please join me in thanking Ibu Eileen Riadi, uh, Ibu Eileen Hambali, Ibu Caroline Riadi, Alex To, Julie McCowan, Dr. Alan Widya Santo, and Dr. Yogi Prawira. Thank you so much for joining us on this event today. We hope that the session has given you hope, has given you a little bit more information and more confidence to build healthy habits for your new generation. Uh, we will now close this session. 
uh, join me in thanking our speakers and uh, see you again on our next opportunity. And thank you, Rachel, for being thank such you. a good moderator. <laughs> Thanks. Rachel. Thank you. We will now play another video just in case you still miss the uh, SPH facilities and you'd like to see them one more time. Thank you, everyone, and have a wonderful day.